Good morning. This is Steve from Southern Illinois. Uh, we're starting to get the uh, currents of wind and humidity coming up from the south from the Gulf today. So things are humid and warm outside. I'm glad to be inside. But it's still a bright early summer day. Speaking of which, as summer has come, um, green has started popping out all over our yard. And the daylilies in the ditch are blooming beautifully. Our mimosa is popping out and will be blooming now all the way till September. It's a beautiful time of year around here. But with that beauty comes some of the, uh, the annual tasks that I face. And one of those is cleaning out the flower beds. <clears throat> and uh, this last week, I did that and I uh, knew what I was getting into. So I uh, put on a long sleeve shirt and I had gloves on and long pants and boots. Now, those of you who know what we're looking at here in this picture know what happened next. And it brings back a story. I used to teach biology at our local community college here. And as one of my exercises, I took the class out into the forest preserve next to town. And I turned them loose. I told them to find something they didn't know anything about. And the first semester that I did that, I made some assumptions. Uh, you know, we live out here in rural America. These are rural young people that have grown up in a rural environment. And when I was growing up in a rural environment, I learned very rapidly to watch out for poison ivy. I learned very quickly that not all rural children learn that lesson. Because every semester, I would have a student, at least one student, come up with me, up to me, with a handful of poison ivy, saying, What is this? These leaves are beautiful. These berries are, can you eat these berries? And the results were predictable. I had, well, I only had one student that I know of that ended in the emergency room. Uh, but many of them ended up with poison ivy rashes. And those are not the only plants that we have to, to uh, watch out for. You know, poison ivy is easy to teach to children. Leaves of three, leave them be. And if they confuse blackberries with poison ivy and they leave the blackberries alone, well, that's okay. Uh, but nettles, how do you easily teach children to recognize nettles so that this that this irritating painful experience is something they do, they don't have i didn't i had to learn by hard experience what nettles looked like my, for myself so how do you sort out the safe from the unsafe that's what we're talking about today sorting them out some of you know that i really like bugs so let's talk about bees and wasps. Up on the top, we've got a yellow jacket. We've got a honeybee. Which of these do you want to hold in your hand? Very good choice. Neither. OK. Here are two, two other hymenoptera. That's the, the scientific term for the family that includes bees and wasps. Which of these do you want to hold in your hand? The top one is a, an eastern carpenter bee. Um, in my neighborhood here, uh, they aren't very popular because a lot of us have wood decks. And carpenter bees, the female carpenter bee, drills a hole into the wood about the, the, the size of your thumb, except it goes in for six to nine inches. And in, in that hole, she carefully builds individual rooms that are lined with wax. Then she collects a ball of pollen that's about a half inch in diameter, stuffs it into that wax-lined cell, and lays an egg. 
Then she closes that cell off and starts the whole process. And pretty soon that tube is full of cell after cell after cell of baby bees growing. Now, the bottom wasp is an inchman wasp. About half of wasps are parasites. That is not a stinger that we're looking at. That's an egg layer. And she uses that egg layer to poke through those wax-lined cells and to get down as deep as she can into that nest that the carpenter bee has built. And then she lays one egg per cell as she pulls her egg layer out. And her babies eat the carpenter bee's babies as the carpenter bee's babies eat the pollen. Which do you want to hold in your hand? Well, my wife says they both look terrifying. Okay, so I'll grant, I'll grant you that. But if you had a choice, hold the one with the long stinger because it's safe regardless of what it looks like. Now here are two others, okay? Uh, the one on the bottom is a bee, but this one has no stinger. About half of bees are parasites. They're called cuckoo bees, and they do what cuckoos do. They lay their eggs in the nests of other bees or animals, okay? And this cuckoo bee, actually, its babies are parasites on other longhorn bees, bees that have long antenna like that. The, the insect on the upper right, though, that's not a bee. That's a fly. It's called a drone fly. They're called drone flies because they don't buzz. They drone like a bee. They make the same sound as a bee does when it's flying. They have the same flight pattern of a, as a bee rather than a, a fly. They fly backwards like a bee, whereas flies don't. Okay, This fly mimics bees, but not so that it can parasitize them. Its babies actually grow in brackish water, or even worse, roadkill. Okay, so the skeptics say, ah, that's where the story in the Old Testament about bees growing in the carcass of a lion came from. Well, maybe, because I have seen people go absolutely bananas when a drone fly flies around them because they think it's a bee. Well, here are two others. Now, the one on the lower left, that's another fly that looks like a bumblebee. Uh, the adults, uh, this is, this is a, a predatory fly, and the adults are robber flies that, that grab flying insects in flight, kill them and eat them while they're still flying. Okay, they are lethal predators. The babies live in rotten wood and they parasitize, they eat the insects that live in rotten wood, beetles, beetle grubs and the like. The one on the right upper hand, when Vivian looked at this, she said, wait a minute, that's upside down. Where's the head? Well, this one isn't a fly. It's not a bee. It's a moth. This is the snor snowberry clearwing moth here in our neighborhood, the, the caterpillars eat honeysuckle and dogbane. The, the adults just sip nectar. So how do you sort out what is safe and what is not safe among insects? You have to know them intimately. When our family went to Africa in the year 2000, I was faced with some unexpected challenges, and it wasn't just diseases and, and uh, technological limitations. I'm curious, and I, ins I insisted on going out in the bush by myself, and I found out that I was totally ignorant of what was safe and what was not safe. 
one day I was I was preaching and uh, I saw a bug fly up towards the light that was over me. And then all of a sudden it darted towards my face. And before I could even move, it had squirted this burning liquid on my cheek. You, you may not be able to see it. Okay, let's see here. Can I? Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I can't point. Okay, there's a dark spot on my face there. Okay, that dark spot is the, the, the scab that was developing. Vivian said that he, as I continued to speak that day, my face just swelled up and everybody could see this red splotch. I got it's this huge blister on, on my cheek right close to my eye because I couldn't recognize a dangerous insect when it flew at me. Walking out into the bush, Plants were even more difficult. I found this beautiful tree one day and broke off a branch and to take it home. And the sap touched my skin and immediately it was like fire on my skin. Later on, I went back and I had these beautiful fluffy seed pods that looked like a milkweed seed pod. I picked one and immediately little spines from it. It was, it was like a cactus that just stuck into my hand. I found myself so ignorant in Africa of what was, what was safe and what was not safe. So why are we talking about this? The last pandemic that we faced here in the United States was AIDS. It struck when I was in medical school. And believe me, the uncertainty that we've experienced with COVID was just as real back in the 1980s when AIDS first introduced itself to the world. We didn't know what caused it. We didn't know how it was spread. It quickly became known as a gay disease, but then we discovered that it wasn't being gay at all that spread it, it was blood. Now today we don't talk about AIDS a whole lot anymore, but this map shows the incidence of new cases of AIDS per 100,000 population in the United States in 2016. And the darkest color on there, uh, part of the scale is hidden behind me, the darkest color on there is about 400 per 100,000. There is no place in the United States that has zero risk. AIDS is still with us. This pandemic has not gone away. And while we now have treatments, the hoped for vaccine has never materialized. And while the treatments help us to live longer, they don't cure the disease. So uh, a strategy developed called serosorting. And the reason I'm talking about all of this today is because this week a, an article came across my medical feeds written by a psychiatrist uh, talking about serosorting and how it applies to COVID. You see, serosorting was the idea that we could cut down on the transmission of AIDS if we tested people and people who were negative only had sex with people who were negative, and people who were positive only had sex with people that were positive. We sorted ourselves behaviorally according to whether we were positive or negative for HIV. This still is something that's talked about, but it leads to some awkward situations. I mean, for example, if you're at a party and a guy catches your eye across the, the, the room. Or you walk up to a girl and you want to strike up a conversation. What pickup lines do you use? Well, I tested negative last week. Uh, how about you? You know, you just don't lead with, are you negative or are you positive? Uh, so when do you introduce it into the conversation? Okay. Do you finally pop the question as you're popping the question and you're down on your knee and you present the ring and you say, honey, before I ask you what I'm going to ask you, I need to know one thing. Are you negative or positive? Okay. When do you pop the question? 
it's socially awkward. And so in the era of AIDS, people didn't want to ask it. And so they started sort of sorting. Okay? That sort of sorting is a substitute for finding out if the other person's positive or negative. So some of the ways that people sort of sorted for HIV were, well, I know that people who have AIDS look sick, therefore he looks healthy. He must not have AIDS. Or I know that people that are my age may have had sex before we knew about AIDS and before we knew how to have safer sex. So I'm going to have it with somebody that's younger than me. I've known her forever. Therefore, she must be safe. He's popular. The other girls like him. He must be safe. And then there's the ever-present social, I don't want to offend. You don't want to tell someone that they look like they might be positive. We're facing a new pandemic this year, COVID. And we've already started sort of sorting. If somebody looks healthy, we assume they're safe, right? I've heard people saying, I'm young, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> or Vivian and I experienced this week. An entire family showed up on our part, on our, our doorstep, and when we answered the door, they came barreling in, oh, giving us hugs. Oh, we're so glad to see you. And the dad followed the kids through the door, and he said, that's okay, we've been quarantined for who knows how long. We're safe. Sort of sorting. And then you have the, don't trample on my freedom, don't make me wear a mask, sort of sorting. And the social pressures of, I don't want to offend. What did Viv and I do when that family showed up? Well, we hugged them back. We didn't want to offend. We didn't want to shove them out the door and say, uh, no, no, we're going to social distance here. This is the picture of what COVID looks like in the United States right now, folks. This is the same graphic as I showed you for AIDS, except the darkest is greater than a thousand cases per 100,000 population. So I suppose there are a couple of counties in, let's see, is that Idaho and Montana? way up there in the mountains, where you could sort of sort and uh, pretty much assume that nobody else had it. But the rest of the, of the country, the rest of the world, sort of sorting is dangerous stuff, folks. How do you sort safe from unsafe? So why are we talking about this today, Steve? Is this just another rant about COVID? Are you talking about Black Lives Matter or COVID? Well, actually, I'm talking about several things, okay? You see, last week, I told you a parable that challenged you to ask the question of whether your heart was like God's or not. Jesus described the judgment this way. On the judgment day, God's going to divide people into the right or the left. Another, another parable, he talked about dividing them into the sheep and the goats. Dividing them into the safe and the unsafe. And as Jesus described it, God is going to use some very unexpected criteria. He's not going to choose, use, are you religious or not? He's going to ask, do you love or do you put your beliefs above loving? He, he's going to do it based on your actions, 
not on your words. Now, does that mean that I believe that beliefs are meaningless? Absolutely not. No, I believe that our actions reflect our beliefs. They reflect the God, however you understand that. They reflect the God that you worship. And therefore, our beliefs are powerful in shaping our actions. And if Jesus' words are true, Christians, our actions are what are we are going to be judged on, not our words. That's a sobering thought. When I was in Africa, I sort of sorted plants and insects based on my experience here in the United States with often uncomfortable results. With AIDS, we sort of sorted people into safe and unsafe, but it did nothing to stop the epidemic. With Black Lives Matters, we, the whole issue is that we sort of sort people into safe and unsafe, desirable and undesirable, based on the color of their skin. Do we do the same thing spiritually? Am I doing the same thing spiritually? That's the question I've had to face personally this week. Have a good day. Be safe. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. <laughs>